hidden in plain sight, our phenomenal world. This is Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. Welcome to a new episode. You'll be getting to know a scientist and a non-scientist who worry for pollinators, but their worry is matched, and maybe even exceeded, by their wonder and passion for them. And they're inspiring people like you and me to go out and marvel at something as small and magnificent as a tiny nectar-gathering insect. First, let me introduce you to Jenea Tanner. She has worked on this podcast for over a year now, and before she moves on to graduate school, there's at least one last story I know she has to tell relative to constant wonder. It's in her back pocket, and I'm not letting her go without sharing it uh, with us now. Jenea, thanks for sitting down at the microphone. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Yesterday, you let it slip that you have a pollinator story to tell, and it actually begins with your niece. She's two years old. Her name is Blair, and she absolutely loves the outdoors, everything about being outside. She just loves to pick up weeds and rocks and dirt. And she was wandering around my parents' garden. There was these little butterflies she was chasing, and then she noticed the dill plant, which was absolutely swarming with wasps. And my reaction, I grabbed her and I start pulling her away, trying to explain that we didn't want to get close to them. But her face lit up and she starts reaching towards these wasps and just saying, hi, hi. And she was trying to grab them and pet them. And and for the rest of the time, that was the only thing she wanted to do. She wanted to be by the dill plant and she wanted to pet those wasps. (laughs) You realize, don't you, that this could happen anywhere to anyone at any time. I think that's part of what makes it wonderful, especially in children. We can see it so easily. They have this intense wonder for the world. It can just happen any day to any person, but I think that's what makes it so full of wonder. Yeah, and are you one of the types of people who ever got that pollinator memo, you know, the one that says pollinators are imperiled? Have you followed that story at all? Yeah. Yeah, I think when my niece is a little older and can understand more that she shouldn't touch the wasps because they might sting her— Um, and I could trust her with that, then I would love to, like, sit there and be able to observe them with her. Grab a wasp and it might just sting you. That's very true. And who among us relishes the thought of being stung by a wasp or bee? But it's a remarkably small risk, actually, so long as you don't vex and annoy them. Obviously, Jenea was right. Little Blair probably shouldn't be too hands-on with bugs that sting. But let me tell you who is more and more hands-on with insects nowadays. A whole lot of grown-ups. For many, it's because of that worrisome memo I mentioned. For others, it's because of the sheer intelligence and beauty, the vitality and wonder of insects. The nexus between bugs and humans is in fact of such vital importance that we just shouldn't be terribly bugged by bugs. On the contrary... Our thriving depends on their thriving, and we see this perhaps most clearly when it comes to the role of pollinators, which in spite of their minute size really should be big-time poster children for a healthy ecosystem. We could also talk about the microscopic foundations of the food chain, smaller than insects, but we'll save that for future shows, or maybe just point you back to our recent episode about algae and photosynthesis. Meanwhile, back to Blair. Most any toddler anywhere might encounter insects on flowers with the gleeful innocence that Jenea got to witness in her niece. Can grown-ups ever find their way back to that intensity of engagement? I want you to meet two special guests who are remarkably observant about small things, and for this alone they have my admiration. But Rachel Taylor and Joseph Wilson have done something more. They've encouraged hundreds of people to become patrons of pupae, coaxers of chrysalises. You don't want to be with me walking the dog at five in the morning because the headlamp will shine on anything that just catches my attention. And that's, you know, some kind of little insect on a tree trunk or, you know, some leaf that's budding out. And it's just like, you can't get me around the block because I'm stopping to look at everything. Bees in particular, but insects in general, they're so fascinating that it's like a primetime TV show with all the intrigue and drama and suspense, but you don't have the commercial. It's free in your own backyard. 
Rachel is the founder of Utah Friends of Monarchs and also a board member of Western Monarch Advocates. She focuses on these iconic butterflies, you know them, famous for pulling off the longest insect migration in North America. Joe Wilson is the lead author of The Bees in Your Backyard, A Guide to North America's Bees. He focuses his scholarship as an academic with Utah State University on wasps and bees. The starting point for my conversation with them was how each of them first fell under the spell of nature and not just insects. I still have those little documents you fill out from elementary school, something called like about me or who am I. You fill out your favorite food and your favorite sport and and all those kinds of information. I was looking at one of those recently. I think it was from second grade. And it says my favorite TV show was Nature. And I'm talking about that PBS Nature show. And I loved to watch that. It was like my highlight of the week, that in wild America. So I loved nature, but in my backyard, I grew up in, in northern Provo. And there was not elk and bears and moose in my backyard like I saw in the nature shows, but there was insects. And so as I was, you know, growing into this exploratory mode in the world of nature, the insects were the things I could actually see in my backyard. Rachel, does that sound familiar to you in terms of your childhood and catching some kind of spark for this? Yes, actually. And I... I didn't grow up that far away from Joe then. I I grew up in Lehigh when it was all, and that's just, what, 30 miles north of of Provo or 20 miles north. And it was all open space and agricultural lands at that point, truly. And uh, I've always had a love of all critters. And I I collected animals. And my poor parents had to deal with me bringing home chipmunks and all sorts of things in the house. And 40 years later, living in Salt Lake after all that time, wondered where the monarchs went just one day. And that's truly, it's like, okay, where did they go? How long ago was that, that you started wondering about monarchs? That was probably 2014, 2015. You have betrayed the fact that uh, your passion has been of such a scope that sometimes maybe your husband feels like, well, that's a little overboard. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yes, in fact, he coined the phrase, she's 60 going on six, (laughs) which kind of refers to my excitement about everything in life in general. And Joe, your conversion to entomology, your passion, that that goes back a little bit further, does it not? My wife is actually the person that got me into bees. She was studying bees when she was in college at Utah State University. She was on a field crew that was doing a big bee study in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. When I met her, she had it was the day she got back from that summer-long field season. She had a, a kayak strapped on the roof of her car, and she had her car packed full of camping gear, and she knew some of my roommates. And so I met her then and thought, wow, she is super cool. you know. And then I got to know her and thought, wow, that research she was doing sounds really fun. And so I started pursuing her to get to know her better. And she got me a job studying bees at that USDA lab that she worked at. The rest is history. So so she studied, my wife studied bees before I did, and she still studies bees with me. We actually do a lot of our field work in the summertime, chasing bees around different parts of the world. And we have three kids that are a fairly good field crew. Some of them swing nets with us. Some of us just watch. Some of us pick the flowers while we swing bee, catch bees off the flowers. But so this is definitely a, a family adventure for me. I think my kids don't even know what a family vacation is like without dad bringing a bug net with him. And Rachel, obviously you have a great concern for all kinds of pollinators, but you have a very particular passion. Why monarchs? I mean, Joe's known for this diverse array of hundreds of different types of uh, bees and pollinators he works with, but you just kind of zeroed in on monarchs. I appreciate all sorts of creatures, but I think it was just the fact that we were losing them. And I remembered them as a kid. They were so plentiful on our irrigation ditches. And and it's just the iconic creature. And the fact that they were going away is what troubled me. And that's when I jumped in to learn why. Joe, was a similar time for you when something clicked and you said, ah, this animal, this insect is in peril? Uh, Maybe not in the same way. I think one of the difficulties with with insects is there's so many of them and most of them we don't know much about. 
And so I think that's more what drew me to the the groups that I kind of honed in on with bees and wasps is because there's so much unknown. It's hard to even say for most bees or wasps for that matter, if they are imperiled, because we don't really know enough about where they used to live or even where they current live to know if things have changed. One of the tricky parts with bees is bees are not consistent across the year, and that's by by nature. So there's more kinds of bees in the deserts, and if you've spent time in the deserts, you know some springs in the desert are, you know, with plentiful wildflowers and are nice and cool, and there's rain, and other springs in the desert are dry and hot. And so because bees have kind of evolved in this desert landscape, they have this ability to remain in in kind of a suspended animation and not emerge in a year there's there was a so there was a graduate student who kind of figured this out he collected some bee nests most bees are solitary they let nest by themselves so it's not a big beehive it's just a single little bee nest he collected some of those and put them in an aquarium on his desk then forgot about them and as graduate students often do they move on to other projects And seven years later, he's sitting at his desk and suddenly he notices all these bees flying around inside this aquarium where he had those nests. And so it showed him that these bees can remain in this kind of suspended animation for at least seven years. And so when we're in our in our yards and we might say, well, I haven't seen these these this one kind of bee that I used to see a lot. It could be because they're not there anymore or it could be because something about the environmental conditions just aren't right for them. And so it really complicates the kind of observational data that we have, because from year to year, it can change dramatically. I want to ask you both about the idea that many people, myself included, can go for year after year in our own suspended animation, if you will, where we're not seeing, we're not observing what's around us. What's right before our eyes, it could be in our backyard, the side yard, the front yard, I, I, you know, it could be in cities, parks, suburban areas, out in the countryside, we humans get diverted away from nature. I'm wondering if we've been oblivious to insects more so than we have been to other creatures. Is it, does, um, that's a generalization, but Rachel, what do you make of that? I think that some people are more aware of things, but yes, in general, I mean, and obviously the tiny, tinier they are, the harder it would be to see them and notice them on a daily basis. But I think, you know, some of us are inclined to notice those things outside. I I don't know that everybody has that curiosity or that, you know, the sense of wonder at what nature has for us out there. How did you get that? What made you become that kind of a person? I've always attributed it to growing up in farmland. But I've always been an animal girl. I'm not quite sure the answer. But we literally had you know, 500 apple trees and acres and acres of things. uh, And outside was all we had, and it captured me. Our guests will be talking of the wonder of insect migration and milkweed and photography and insect complexity a little later on as our conversation continues. A quick sidebar here. On my very own personal awakening to flutterbys, more formally Lepidoptera, fourth grade, I wanted to mimic what experts could do as collectors, you know, catching various specimens, mounting them on a board as though I were a curator for some natural history museum. So I went out and caught maybe half a dozen butterflies and moths. I, I remember in great detail what happened with the beauty called a mourning cloak quite a common butterfly, actually, with its outer yellow fringe lined by striking blue dots and the predominantly gray-black wings. Well, somewhere I had read that if you soaked a small chunk of casting plaster in nail polish remover, put it in a jar with your live insect, wait for 24 hours, it would be dead enough to mount. So that's what I did. I took the inert butterfly from its killing jar one evening, Its exoskeleton was very resistant, as I remember, to the the puncturing of the tip of the pin through the thorax. Had to be persistent. It made a little popping sound. And I pinned it to a cork board that I had covered with a scrap of green felt. And then I just took it all in, the specimen, its beauty, and what I had accomplished on my very own. And I went to bed. I want you now to imagine my feelings the next morning when, to my chagrin, and mixed with some shame, considerable shame, I would say, I discovered its legs moving wildly about, shredded remnants of the wings 
flapping rapidly, tiny little shards of the dusky cloak lying hither and yon. It simply refused to accept the fact that it was a goner. Shades of the invincible Black Knight from Monty Python. But in all seriousness, I felt... Well, well, I felt like I should never have done that. I actually hurt inside, and to tell you the truth, I, I still do. You're listening to Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. One of the things that catches attention, like few other things, is stories of migration. And I know that there are there's more than just monarchs among the insects that actually do migrate. Uh, anything from a dragonfly to, well, just in 2019, I read uh, there, an, an article of hoverflies by the hundreds of millions making a migration across the English Channel. And I guess radar had detected this kind of a thing. And uh, I don't know the full range of migratory insects, but is there something about migration, Joe, that tells a story that is more captivating for people than just uh, other kind of more sedentary insect stories? Yeah, well, you know, I think that one of the challenges with our connection to insects is insects are very different from us. If you look at the documentaries on TV, most of them are about mammals, and we are mammals. And so we can connect with those animals. They, they kind of seem like us and they have babies like us and they have the same challenges as us or we can make that connection. But with insects, it's such a different world. It seems almost alien. But when we see some of these more complex behaviors or seemingly complex behaviors like migration, it kind of maybe uh, elevates that, that creature to a higher plane in our minds, maybe subconsciously. But I, so I think that the migration makes them seem almost more intelligent or more animal-like than when we just see a, a fly flying past. Well, I'm really asking you to comment on human nature more than anything else mm -hmm. here and what captures our attention. But Rachel, it does seem to me that what Joe is saying has some, it will have some cachet with me, the idea that we're drawn to a story of complex behavior in animals and Surely migration is part of the attraction for you. Absolutely. In fact, I've I've visited many of the California sites where monarchs overwinter. I've visited three of the four public sites in Mexico um, where the monarchs overwinter. And it's so remarkable. I, I do think that, and Joe, you can correct me, the monarchs are the only insect that does a two-way migration. Uh, as monarchs reach adult stage in late summer, regardless of where they are across the nation, something, environmental cues or whatever, trigger them to not be a breeding generation. They, they go into a diapause and they save that energy so that they can uh, make those long journeys to protect the species. And so, so when, what, you say, when you say a two-way migration, the way I heard that is that there's two, two different modes of existence for this, and one of them is let's reproduce, and the other is let's get on our way? Absolutely. So for the monarchs, for example, there's maybe four or five total generations per year. Four of those last three to five weeks. The other one is seven to nine months. And so a monarch that happens to be hatched or it closes in Winnipeg, Canada, they just found a tag, two of them, as a matter of fact, made a 3,900-mile journey to the site in Mexico to overwinter where it's warm enough. And then they have to, they, they hang out with no food until spring. And then they have to migrate back to find milkweed to lay eggs on. And that winds down their lifespan. So it's going both directions. Which type have the shorter lifespan? Uh, the ones that are parenting or the ones that are traveling? The ones that are breeding and moving northward. Yeah. Well, this um, this complexity, though, is the thing that I think also is what has uh, attracted a lot of attention uh, from people who are joining, say, your Facebook group or, or following the migration. There is something so dramatic about the distances, the heroism of this migration. There's such a story there that, in a way, it's like, if only other insects could pull this off, they might get some attention too, you know, Joe? Yeah, you know, and to add to that complexity, one of the aspects of this migration that's interesting is so uh, a monarch that is born 
or the egg is laid in August or, or something and it, it turns into a caterpillar and it eats and it turns into a chrysalis and it emerges as a beautiful monarch in the fall, it has never been to Mexico. Its whole life was in, you know, Alberta. But then it migrates down to Mexico where its parents or its grandparents came from. And so it's this, it's this amazing ability that they have this migration location programmed into their DNA. So it's not like it's not like a salmon that they're going back to the stream that they hatched from. It's that they are going back to the location that their grandparents came from. And that's just super fascinating. And sometimes the very same trees, literally. By tagging, they know this? Yes. Ah, that's fascinating. You know, it's so interesting. When I thought about having the two of you come and join with us for a conversation, I realized that Rachel is very focused on one, is it a species or a subspecies? Uh, and, and Joseph, you're so well known for uh, teaching people about the broad diversity of bees and wasps. And I thought, can we have these two people in the same room and tell the same story? Uh, but would you address, uh, Joe, for a moment, the idea that our familiarity with a monarch is really straightforward because of media coverage, I would say. Whereas your task is to try to familiarize people with hundreds of different types of species. And I just wonder if that's a losing proposition. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a challenge. And I think it is a lot with media coverage. So in North America, there are 4,000 kinds of bees, 4,000 species. That's four times as many species of bee as species of birds. So we have you know thousands and thousands of birders that spend a lot of time out with their binoculars looking at all the different bird species, but we don't have that many people going out and looking at bees, or even people that recognize that there's more than you know five different kinds of bees. And it, it's a challenge because media coverage really drives the conservation efforts. And one of the things I've tried to do is shift the media coverage from honeybees to all these wild bees. When I say there's 4,000 species of bee, one of them is the honeybee, and it's not from North America. It was brought over by European settlers several hundred years ago. Uh, I think of the honeybee more like livestock, and then there's all the wild bees that are the wildlife. And so, I mean, it's a challenge, but part of the maybe the failure in this PR campaign is that the scientists, we often get so focused on what we are doing, we fail to convey this broader picture of the diversity or of the beauty and just complexity of these other creatures. There are many bees, are there not, that uh, most people wouldn't even recognize as, as a bee, they would confuse it for a fly. Yeah, most bees, in fact, don't look like a honeybee. Most bees are not like that. Most bees are gray or brown. Some of them are metallic blue or metallic green. Most of them are smaller than honeybees. The smallest bee in probably the world is two millimeters long. It lives down in, in the Mojave Desert and Sonoran Desert in, in North America. Two millimeters is the size of George Washington's nose on a quarter. So that is a very small bee. I have to and, get out a quarter now. Yeah, yeah, you need to get a quarter out and see how big that nose is and imagine a little red bee on there. It doesn't have stripes, <laughs> uh, it, but it is very much a bee and it pollinates. It's it's this it's changing this perception is what's been really challenging with bees. Monarchs, I think, doesn't maybe have that same challenge because they are so iconic. Yeah. You also have the problem of your beloved bees often <laughs> have a defense mechanism that the butterflies are lacking. No, that's true. And it's interesting because when I first wrote uh, my book with my friend Olivia, I was doing some some media things and I did I did a, a morning show in Texas. And she said, here's Dr. Joseph Wilson, the author of The Bees in Your Backyard. And I was ready to talk about how cool bees are. But the first thing this anchor says is, bees in your backyard, that sounds scary. And I, it kind of mm. took me back a little bit. I thought, well, I, I, it's not scary to me. Like that's not, it's not even part of what my thinking is. But I, I recognize that bees have this kind of fear factor with them. And I'm trying to change that because most of them are not these stinging, bloodthirsty insects that we think of them as. I went out in my garden this morning, and at this time of year, we're having our conversation mid-June, I have a, a plant that is in the American West called a palmer penstemon, and the place is just alive today with bumblebees. 
uh, because of the it's in the time of bloom. And it took me a long time to realize that I could co-mingle with them and be perfectly safe. You know, mm-hmm. um, that's the that's the battle you're fighting. It is. And that's what I often tell people to do is go into their flower garden, just bring a chair out there and just sit down because none of those bees will sting you if you're just sitting there watching them. The, you know, you can be three inches away from their nest entrance and they will just work. The only time you really get stung is when you are actively threatening them by trying to squish them or accidentally stepping on them or if they fly down your, the collar of your shirt or something. But they're really, really reluctant to sting. Now, one of the things that brackets the two of you together is that both of you are very keen on teaching us, uh, sharing with us, or even exploring for yourself, the broader environment in which this animal uh, can thrive or, or languish. And so, uh, having mentioned my, my flower, my Palmer pen stem, and uh, Rachel, there's a great excitement in your Facebook community with people talking about plants almost as much as their beloved monarch butterflies. Absolutely. And it's the lack thereof that is causing part of the problem with the monarchs. I've got to say one thing just about, you know, monarchs versus all the other bugs. And I, I realize that we have to look at them. I kind of look at them two ways. They, are, they can be our conservation ambassador. They are quite the iconic creature. But also I, I designed a fun t-shirt with all the insects all over it. And it was, you know, it had the monarch at the top and it said, you know, monarchs, a gateway bug. <laughs> <laughs> because really, once you start paying attention to what's out there with them, you do have the bees that are sharing the blossoms with the with the monarchs, with the hummingbirds. I mean, and you really start to notice all the things that are alive in our gardens. But, but yeah, we, you know, we try to help educate people and then also help educate them that, you know, Utah has more than just one milkweed species. You know, there are 100 species across the nation. You know, we've probably got 15. It's just more of telling the, the bigger picture so that they can get in, excited about more in our outdoors. And we say outdoors and we forget that outdoors can be just literally outside the door. It can be right in our yard. And that brings me once again to the idea of the backyardness of all of this. You know, Joe, the word backyard, it's right in your title. Uh, Shed a little light, would you, on why you're working so hard to take us out there and to see not just the insects, but the places where they're living and the interactions there. Yeah, no, that's that's a big focus uh, of mine because... One of the biggest threats to bees broadly, especially the wild bees, is habitat change. And humans are really good at changing habitat. We change prairies into agricultural land, or we change the Wasatch Front from uh, sagebrush hills into housing. So when we make those changes, we disrupt some of the habitat needs for these wild bees. But we can kind of supplement for those needs in our own yards fairly simply. Planting flowers like Palmer's Penstemon or other native flowers is a big step because we're then providing for those native bees. But even the landscaping, we can landscape our yards in ways that can be visually appealing still, but also is providing habitat for bees. Because these bees have lived here for a long time and they can thrive in our neighborhoods just like us. We just have to make uh, kind of a, a concerted effort for that to happen. You know, it's probably this concerted effort you're talking about that interests me the very most today as I'm speaking with you both because so many people are getting involved. And and Rachel, part of what your community of monarch lovers does, we could call it intervention uh, of varying degrees, Uh, what, what people are doing, they're either planting things or trying to help. People actually have to save the eggs on plants and bring them indoors and, and nurse them along. Why? It's a heated issue. It's it's human nature. You want to nurture and, and provide, you know, help save them, you know, any little egg that you see. But just in general, you know, 97% of the eggs that are laid don't make it to adulthood. And that's not the part of the recent decline, the climate change, the chemicals, the you know, the different things. Well, what is it then? Is it just like normal predation? Yeah, normal predation. And that's just part of the food chain. Other other creatures, other little beetles and bugs and spiders and ants eat the eggs. Have you been all torn up inside, wondering whether to intervene or not? Oh, I've had plenty. I, I spent the first couple of years intervening and, and saving every egg I could find. And it's just, it's not the solution. You know, if we're collecting every egg and rearing them and turning them loose, 
they still aren't going to have the environment that they need to thrive. They're not going to have the pollinator plants. They're not going to have the clean water. They're not going to have the milkweed. It's not the solution. And so it's got to be a balance. Uh, Joe, I see you nodding your head. And this whole problem of intervening to save something, you know, on constant wonder, we th- we, we, we're very committed to the idea that the world is full of wonder and that we ought to be maybe reverent towards that or uh, respectful And conservation has a long history of intervention. And when it comes to, say, wasps, bees, that sort of thing, am I so misguided to plant a few things in my yard, Joe? I think there's lots of different levels of intervention. I think planting things, I wouldn't necessarily call it intervention. And I think I'm not an interventionist. I think maybe at times in my life I have been. But I think that we as humans, especially when it comes around conservation, we often get very myopic. We see the thing that's close to us, but we don't see the broader picture. And if we are nearsighted about this and we're just focusing on, let's use monarchs, for example, if we say every egg needs to turn into a butterfly, then we might be missing the whole picture that there's more that is threatening the monarchs besides the number of eggs turning into butterflies. And so if we release thousands of butterflies and still don't provide habitat for them, that will be doing no good at all. And so I think if we can look more broadly, take a step back and take a breath and and try to make some meaningful changes rather than something that is simple and fast. So if you would give me just a few categories of safe, simple, moderate kinds of actions, activities that that I can feel good about. Leaving some natural habitat around. If you can do some landscaping using, they call it naturescaping, uh, using some natural vegetation or natural landscaping that natural landscape actually provides the needs for the nature, right? It provides food and it provides habitat. And so for bees, step one would be to plant some native plants. The bees have have lived with these native plants for millions of years. They have a close relationship and that can provide for them. And so we can do that without much change in our yard at all. Even if you're living in an apartment building downtown in a city somewhere, you can have a flower on your porch and there are studies from cities in Europe that show that there are wild bees that visit those you know, rooftop gardens or gardens on the, the balconies. And you can do it in two ways. You can plant for the bees and for yourself, you can plant various herbs. And those herbs often provide flowers that are visited by bees. And then you can use your fresh basil in the summer and make some tasty salads. Rather than fighting against nature, as humans have done for the last several hundred years, let's try to embrace nature and incorporate nature into our in our own individual landscapes. And so that's going to help a lot of things, including the bees and the butterflies and other animals. I have a boy who's now 14, but I remember three, four years ago, we went out, we found some old logs, we drilled some holes in them, we had read up about placing them. And we had this grand experiment. They were hardwood logs, and that drilling was so tough. And we gave up mm-hmm. after we had made only about, oh, 25 or so holes. But the, <laughs> but the next year, we found that uh, some type of bee had actually used that for nesting purposes and capped them off. And um, the bee hotel thing, is that, a, is that a good craze? There are mixed reviews about bee hotels. In nature, 70% of bees, 70% or so, will nest in a hole in the ground that they dig. So they like these bare patches of ground. Um, that leaves 30% to nest in other places. And a, a bunch of those nest in in nature, they'll nest in pre-existing cavities, like a hole in an old dead log. A lot of dead logs, beetles have burrowed into it in the past, and they leave kind of a little hole that goes back into a, a little tunnel where a beetle grew up 20 years ago. Bees will find that abandoned beetle burrow and repurpose it. The mason bees will line it with mud, the leaf cutter bees will line it with leaves, and that's where they, they make their nest. In our neighborhoods, we no longer leave dead logs around. We don't even leave, leave dead branches in our trees. And so these natural areas for these bees that nest in pre-existing holes don't really exist in our neighborhoods. And so this idea of building a bee hotel, and there's various ways you can build a bee hotel, what it is doing is supplementing these cavity nesting areas for these bees that naturally nest in these empty holes. You can do it like you did by drilling holes in a dead log and bees will find those holes and and nest in them. Or you can bundle up a bunch of hollow reeds together and they will nest in those hollow reeds. You can buy bee hotels from the store. Uh, In my, my experience, they don't work as well. But the idea is you're providing habitat that is no longer in the neighborhood. One of the dangers in that, and we've, we've learned this danger over the last two years with COVID-19, 
Social distancing allows us to reduce the spread of disease. When we eliminate social distancing, we spread disease faster. And so in nature, these holes in dead logs are socially distanced naturally. When we build a bee hotel, we are removing some of that social distance. And so there is an increased opportunity for pathogens and fungus and parasites to spread more easily among those those nests in the bee hotel. And so it's kind of a, there's a balancing act. If we don't make bee hotels, there's no habitat, and that's not good for the bees. If we make bee hotels, that has a potential to increase some parasitism. As a biologist in my yard, I have several bee hotels, And knowing that potential danger of spreading pathogens, I also realize as a biologist that pathogens and parasites are part of nature. And so I do have some parasitic wasps that will visit my bee hotel and parasitize those bee nests. But I think this is part of maturing out of the myopia of of bee conservation. This comes back to the idea that nature can be messy, doesn't it? It does, it does. And so why does that bee deserve to live more than the parasitic wasp? I don't need to make that choice. I am just going to provide some habitat that my lawn does not provide, and and I will leave it at that. And Rachel, what have your activities, your your favorite activities, been along these lines of doing something? I know that you advocate for. Let's be kind of moderate about this. Yeah, but I do. Um, you know, I have I have milkweed being grown by the state prison, and I do give that out to different organizations and for city parks and individuals just to add this little segment of, you know, a little habitat in their gardens that can support monarchs and other pollinators. So we encourage adding the plants themselves, the native plants. We encourage using less chemicals in your yard that will benefit all the insects. It's like Joe said, you know, leaving that little messy area. I think of them of messy natural areas in your yard that aren't just turf and, and, perfect landscaping, you know, give them somewhere to thrive. Now, to you or me, that somewhere to thrive might look downright inhospitable, like that patch of seemingly barren ground that Joe Wilson was talking about, all empty and looking lifeless. Well, that very spot might be the most desirable place for something like a wasp or a bee, to call home. Making our surroundings more bioreceptive. That word came up previously on Constant Wonder when we met Adam Nicholson. You may remember the episode. He told us about constructing his tide pools on the coast of Scotland just to see what kinds of life might take hold there. Well, not long after visiting with Joe and Rachel about their interest in making places more bioreceptive, Eric Schultzka, one of our producers, came in with a video that he had taken right at his home. He shared it with me and with other folks around here. and It immediately made me think of Joe and Rachel putting out a welcome mat for smaller citizens living around us. The scene for Eric's story is one of those bare patches of ground. You came to the office not long ago with a video that you had taken, and uh, there's a little bit of a story behind it. My title for your story is What the Cat Saw, and uh, I won't give a spoiler here. You tell us what the cat saw. All right. I was uh, in my garden working on building some terracing on on a sloped area, and so there was a lot of bare dirt around. And my cat, Pippin, was about 10 or 15 feet away from me, He was watching something, and so I'm sitting there working out of the corner of my eye. He just sits there watching intently. Sometimes he arches his back. He'll kind of pivot, look at it sideways, and he's focusing on one little point. And this goes on for like over 10 minutes. Of course it does. Cats take their time when they're focused like that. Yes, they do. That's how they catch prey, too, is they will sit still for a long time. So finally, I was like, there's something really interesting going on over there. So I walked over, and he was focusing on a little tiny hole in the dirt, when I got down there, I, we kind of like made eye contact, he and I, and it was, it was clear that he was like, okay, here, I'll show you what I was watching. He tries once to disturb the dirt with his paw and nothing happens. So the second time, he very, very carefully puts his paw on the edge of the hole and scrapes it just gently across the dirt to disturb the dirt. And instantly, this little wasp comes crawling out of the hole, cleaning up the dirt that Pippin had carefully placed there just so he could get the wasp to come out so he could show it to me. 
that's what he was doing. Was he was sharing that experience with me. Well, once he showed you the wasp, did he persuade you to take as much interest in the insect as he was taking? You know, it's funny because I've seen wasps before, and I've seen, it wasn't to me as thrilling as it apparently was to him. I actually, I, I mean, the phenomenon of the wasp building that little home was fascinating, but I, I was actually more compelled by kind of the layering of, of the cat being totally absorbed in that little piece of natural wonder. You're listening to Constant Wonder. Next, a festive community spirit has emerged in Rachel's group, Utah Friends of Monarchs. And for his part, Joe has spurred on a parallel passion among people who have come to believe that backyard bees are something to love. I'm wondering about what the celebration has been, because I've, I've seen specifically, Rachel, on, in your Facebook group, so many happy people. They're just, they've just been so happy to uh, report during the migration what they're seeing. There have been contests. There have been uh, festivals and, and uh, pictures, pictures, pictures everywhere of here's the first egg of a monarch in my county, that sort of thing. How do you account for the fact that people are celebrating? Because we got so close to not having them. I mean, in the fall of 2020, you know, they do a, a Western monarch count. They do an Eastern monarch count in the winter. And the Western monarch count that year hit 1,914 monarchs down from about four and a half million in the 1980s. That's west of the Rockies. So we got down to a countable 1,900 monarchs. And like I did not even expect to see them coming back to Utah the next year. And that's when I really pushed that photo contest to see okay, first person in each county to document some kind of one stage of a monarch really got people engaged again. So I have continued that contest, but I think we know that we're on the brink. And so it is fun to see them. Insects tend to be small. And so it's difficult to see how beautiful they are unless you get close. And you either have to catch them and stop them or you have to snuggle up to them or take, or take a picture somehow. Photography, Rachel, there's, there's a power in showing people up close and personal what, what a monarch is. Absolutely, absolutely. And all I'm using is my iPhone. And I did get a new little macro lens for it, though. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, just to be able to capture those lacewing eggs or, you know, the monarch or an egg, a monarch egg, or that royal blue beetle, Joe, I'm not sure what it is, but it, the color was just like metallic blue out in the middle of a horse field property in American Fork. And it's like, this shouldn't be nature. This is a jewel. <laughs> it's just exactly. those kind of things that you can capture just with your iPhone. Joe, what about the fact that they're so small, they're hard to see, and, and photography certainly helps? Oh, photography is is pivotal. It's essential because they're so small. I mean, so many bees are less than a half an inch long and they're so beautiful, but that beauty is easily overlooked unless you're really trying and happen to have really good vision. So I think that the photography is, is really what kind of brings them to life. And people will say, I didn't write, realize that could be a bee. Or if you show them, if you show them that two millimeter long bee on a quarter, it just is almost like mind expanding because it's it's changing this search image uh it also enables people to kind of see some of those intricate details which we can see we're norm we're used to seeing with big animals but with the small animals you kind of really need it to to be frozen in time which is what photography does it's easier to get excited about a simple story like here is one discrete entity called a monarch, or here is one small thing called a mason bee. But the more complex the story, the bee isn't living in isolation. It might need water or might need mud or a particular kind of flower or pollen. And then you start talking about seasons and climate and, and, and the threats. It, it becomes such a complicated story that people kind of, I wonder if they kind of peter out, you know, and yeah. What do you do about that, Joe? I have tried to kind of develop stories about different kinds of bees, knowing that they're kind of oversimplifications, 
but at least it will get people this I, knowing this idea that there is something called a mason bee that uses mud or something that's called a leaf cutter bee that makes wallpaper rooms using leaf bits. So as I tell the stories, people can feel a little bit more of an affinity to them, but it's definitely a challenge. And Rachel, for your part, uh, what do you do to help people see the multiple facets of this monarch story and and see that it too is very complex and and has been oversimplified? I, I think it's trying to get people outdoors and into the habitats, you know, get them out there seeing what else is around. Like I would not have known that had I not planted Rocky Mountain Bee plant and discovered that it is absolutely the most insanely addictive plant for butterflies and bees that I've ever had in my yard, I wouldn't have noticed these bees taking naps underneath the blossoms. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I've got beautiful pictures of these great big bees sleeping. You know, I go out in the morning. It's just, you have to be get people outside to see this and hopefully the miracles you know, hopefully they start to witness things and start to pay attention. But you can't do that from inside with, a, you know, with your face in a computer. I remember for the first time ever that I saw a blue jay, a true blue jay east of the Rocky Mountains. I'm a westerner. And so when I saw one, I was so thrilled that they're just everywhere over there, apparently, across the Rockies. Uh, but for me, it was a rare moment. Do you, each of you get a little excited about something when you you know it's rare that that seems to be a human predisposition the rarity of something you know it it is but i saw for example last spring my wife and i were doing some research down in southern utah there's an endangered poppy that has a, a really rare bee on it and that bee hasn't been seen in southern utah for nearly 40 years, maybe 30 years. So some scientists have suggested it's it's locally extinct. And so we have spent some time looking for it. And while we didn't find that really rare bee, my wife did collect an undescribed bee species. So a species that scientists didn't even know existed until she collected it. And so that's exciting. And a lot of people, when they hear that, they think, oh, wow, that, you know, that must be like the, the most exciting thing in your life. It's going to make your career. But what's so cool about bees is that happens all the time. Uh, there are so many unknowns with bees that almost every time we go out and do a broader survey of an area, we find unknown species. In that survey of the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument I talked about that I was participating in 20 years ago, we found 50 undescribed species. So there's just so much unknown in the world of bees that it seems like it's always an adventure. And yes, I do get little butterflies in my stomach when I find something that's specifically exciting. Rachel, that six-year-old inside you that your husband <laughs> says is there, um, has that six-year-old had just a, a tremendously exciting moment recently? Absolutely. And it is when a friend of mine uh, did notice that she had a monarch came through her yard here locally, and she did grab all the eggs. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll take two, because I, I do like to have a couple to share just because is it engages people more than the story can. And I did give one of those um, to a new friend who is now a conservation ambassador herself. I mean, it's just seeing, bringing that six-year-old out of anybody that you're with. It's just watching that wonder happen again and, and seeing it through somebody else's eyes is just, it's just the magic of it all. It makes it all worth it. To round out this episode of the Constant Wonder podcast, we have for you a winged insect encounter. It's really worth sharing. And it's as much about the observer, I would say, as it is about the observed. The observer in this life and death situation just happens to have been our very own producer, Tenery Taylor. So, Tenery, I told you my story of the little morning cloak that I had pinned to a mounting <laughs> board. And just that very afternoon after I told you the story, something happened to you that I want you to share. Well, yeah, I left work early that day. We had planned with my kids who are visiting in town to go to a reservoir that we like to go to to kayak and paddleboard. So we were going to do that in the evening. And your story was kind of ringing in my ear because it was so... It was just so um, vivid and graphic and violent even. Well, yes. That's how it came across to me. Anyway, 
It's getting to be evening, so the sun has actually already set. But there's still that beautiful light left, and that's when the fish like to jump. And so this reservoir has lots of fish. So we had seen fish jumping, and you can kind of see them, you know, the bubbles coming up from from below as they're swimming or doing their thing down below. And I'm paddling back to shore. We're ready to load up the, the paddle boards and kayaks and, and head home before it's totally dark. And so I see this bubbling up ahead of me, and I think it's a fish, except it's consistent in the same place, this bubbling and rippling. And so I I paddle by, kind of look at it, and I think, that's not a fish. And and I wasn't quite sure what it was. I spun my paddleboard around, which... You, you, they don't spin on a dime, exactly. <laughs> They're kind of long. Well, you could make it happen. I couldn't do that. <laughs> uh, so even with all my prowess, uh, I, I, I have to kind of circle in a big circle back, and I see that it's actually a dragonfly, which looks to me like it's struggling in the water and about to drown. I have no idea if this is actually a thing that the dragonfly was doing deliberately. I don't know. Maybe it was. But to me, I've got this story of... (laughs) It it wasn't just they're doing the backstroke for fun. Well, it was doing the backstroke, but it didn't look fun. (laughs) (laughs) So so you you have to step in and be the rescuer, Well, yeah, because I've got this story of yours ringing in my ears about how you, like... Killed a butterfly. I, yes. <laughs> and prolonged its death. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how you tortured it un, unwittingly. And I thought, I, I've got to reverse the karma in the world and go get this dragonfly. So I actually can't get close enough to, to reach over and scoop it with my paddle. I have to lay down on the board and fish it out with my hand because I, it, paddle boards are just not that precise. So... I scoop it up and flop it out on the bow of my paddleboard where it stays motionless. It's not, I thought, oh, maybe it's going to fly away. I, I, I don't know if they can fly when they're wet. But anyway, it stayed right there like a figurehead on my paddleboard <laughs> as I returned to shore where I then scooped it up and put it onto a bush. Hopefully that was the right thing to do. For being our guests today, sincere thanks to Rachel Taylor, founder of Utah Friends of Monarchs and a well-known monarch butterfly advocate, and to Joseph Wilson, lead author of The Bees in Your Backyard, A Guide to North America's Bees. Joe's a professor at Utah State University and teaches on the Tooele, Utah campus. Daniel McDonald was our production assistant, spearheading this episode with support from Jenea Tanner and Zoe Cook, and we're also grateful to the BYU Broadcasting Sound Design folks including Parker Schmidt and Mitchell Towsley. Spread your own wonder for our phenomenal world by simply sharing a link to our podcast with a friend. They'll thank you for introducing them to Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. <laughs>